Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Mitchell Weiss. Mitchell is the Chief Robotics Officer at HDS Global and a very accomplished roboticist. Mitchell, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Spencer. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. <laughs> so, All you... right. Let's pat each other on the back 50 times. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was only about seven, but it's a start. Yeah. So... I, I guess when I started to do your intro, I was mentioning some of the things I know that you've done, and you know better than me what your background is. Um, do you want to give kind of the dog and pony show just for the people listening? I can do a quickie. I can try and do a quickie <laughs> since the first robot I built was back in 73. I, I built robots in high school and went off to the Institute, MIT, and I built walking machines at MIT. And my summer job, I got to work on this thing behind me. On the space shuttle manipulator that was a canadian company and i being a canadian at the time got to work on things like that <laughs> got great stories about that you know the shuttle flew on core memory little magnetic donuts and pieces of wire wait actually yeah how do you how did you were those loaded in or was that just permanently mounted i'm guessing yeah it was uh the core was there were three little mainframes on the shuttle GPCs, they were called general purpose computers made by IBM. And they each had racks of core memory. And one of the jobs I had to do in the summer job was figure out how many add, subtracts, multiplies, it, and divides it would take to do um, force sensing on the wrist of the robot arm. And they needed to know that because they needed to know if there was enough memory flying on the space shuttle to do that. When the shuttle flew, they were swapping programs in and out all the time. Because this tech was early tech. The things that they could do to get to the moon and stuff was just stunning what they did it with. You couldn't use solid state memory because the alpha particles in space would knock bits out of the memory. Huh. So I had to use good old core, magnetic core memory. Anyhow, so I worked on the shuttle manipulator, then I went to work at Unimation. I was the first applications engineer on the Puma robot, uh, which ended up, thanks to Kevin Dowling, he hooked me up with the Smithsonian when they inducted a Puma into the Smithsonian. <laughs> and I was there. Um, for part of an oral history project they did over a couple of days where the folks from GM who spec'd it out and Vic Scheiman and, and uh, Brian Carlisle and, and Bruce Shimano who designed it and Joe Engelberger was at this thing. Oh, cool. And the Putz kid was at the thing too because I was an apps engineer. <laughs> um, and I left, I, I, I left Unimation with another guy from there and we started United States Robots which built the first all-digital electric robot in those days you know you built your own power amplifiers and we actually bought the power supply but we built our own amps our own gearboxes did our own castings all that good stuff um sold that company in 82 to square d i left in 85 and started a material handling company called programmation we ended up being the biggest supplier of clean room amhs systems in the US of A, at 30% of the Asian market, 60% of the European market, 100% of the US market. Wow. So back to PRI. <laughs> um, we went public, did all kinds of great things. And the dot com bust came along and Brooks bought PRI. And uh, about a year later, I was gone. And then I went to work for Seagrid and a Pittsburgh company. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hans Moravec's idea, 3D evidence grids, vision-based mobile robots. Seagrid's still out there, still doing pretty well. 
big supply of robots. After about 15 years, I got kind of bored. And I went to work for Piaggio Group, the makers of the Vespa scooter and Moto Guzzi motorcycles. And at Piaggio Group, we had a subsidiary in Boston called PFF, Piaggio Fast Forward. And we made a product called Gita, which is a personal robot that follows you using vision. Um, and after four years, I left there and came to work at HDS. Awesome. Yeah, I was I was struck by how much that personal robot looks like the Kugel Panzer last time we talked. I thought it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody on the design team must have had a look at that at some point in time. But it's a really neat machine. It's awesome. Um, what we pulled off there, the cost of goods on that thing is so ridiculously low. You know, it's a two-wheel differentially steered machine that's also self-balancing. So it's a three-axis robot. It's got stereo vision in front to track you. It's got a monocular camera, and it's got a 3D radar system on it. It's got radar? It's got radar. It's got radar that is used in uh, backup sensing, forward protection, forward braking. The same radar tech that we built into Jita, we also provide to the Piaggio group to put on their motorcycles for blind spot detection. That's awesome. And uh, so it's all very cool stuff. Uh, the thing that was really fun at PFF was learning how to really drive costs down for consumer products. The thing that was less fun was PFF is a design-driven company. So you got designers handing you shapes and saying, yeah, make this. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going, ah, but there's a flow problem. Anyhow, I'm using all of that now, everything I learned about making plastic and die castings and, and sourcing stuff really cheaply to really try and turn uh, warehousing and logistics, order fulfillment is what we do at HDS on its ear. So we're going to be molding our own parts and extruding our own stuff and casting our own stuff. That's awesome. So, yeah. So I was going to ask what some of the tricks were to bring the cost down, but you already told me <laughs> before I even asked. So. Well, I can tell everybody else. Extruding, molding, casting. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's... yeah, Jita is a completely plastic machine. The new versions of Jita, almost completely plastic. The axle and the linkage that holds it is cast aluminum and machined steel. But the body of the machine, the chassis of the machine, is molded plastic. That's awesome. Even the wheels and tires are molded plastic. You know, Do you 30, have uh, glass filled plastic? That's awesome. The tires are plastic? You're not using rubber for that? No, the tire is, is actually expanded vinyl acetate, EVA, which is what's in the midsole of your shoe. Cool. So the wheel itself is a molded plastic part, and then the EVA tire is molded over that. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, and everything was designed. So the tread pattern, we got a design patent on. What's novel about the tread pattern? It, it, that's the beauty of design patents. They don't have to be Touché. novel. It's not a utility just, patent. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, but we had to come up with a good looking tread pattern that was easy to pull out of the mold yeah, instead of doing sense. something really complex. I mean, real tire companies have lots of sliders in their tools and their molds because the patterns are so complex. That's interesting. I would not have thought that, but now that you say it, it makes perfect sense. I just yeah. put Pirelli tires on my car, and those things are pretty looking. I can't imagine they were easy to make. <laughs> and not tires are, are actually a a layup, right? You lay up the beads and stuff onto these mandrels, and then you put them into a machine, and they mold the rubber around it. And they have to have a different tool for every size wheel and tire. It's That's evil. interesting. So you've got a line, but then that line is really made up of a bunch of different tooling for every size. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. That's got to cost a fortune to put it. After you. 
That's why tires cost so much. Yeah, it makes sense. Because you're not paying for the actual material, and the material is more than you think it is. It's a layup. It's not just a rubber yeah. casting. And then even right. then, the tooling cost has got to be astronomical because for every single one times, I don't know how many sizes, maybe 30 it's if I had to guess. It's a multi-part tool, right? So if you're, yeah, but you need, like one of the things we had a struggle with, with Cheetah, if you look at the shapes of it, you can't just do a male and female and mold the parts. We had to have inserts, places for screws, and things to catch and snaps. So every one of those requires a slider in the injection molding tool. The more sliders, the more money. And so at HDS, I convinced them to not do a square tray, but to do a taper tray because the tooling cost is like half. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> little stuff. Little stuff you learn along the way. Yeah. And we sourced our motors in China. Just, awesome. You know, you want a brushless DC motor, you can go to Maxon. Pay two, three hundred dollars or whatever. Uh, pay six, seven, eight hundred dollars for them. Touche. <laughs> Buy them in China for two hundred bucks. Um, they're not quite as good, but price performance is fantastic. I mean, think about it. Every power tool you buy, Milwaukee Tools, good high class company, DeWalt, uh, Makita, is owned by the same company that owns Ryobi Tools. Yeah. Mixed job. And they're all brushless motors now. They're, you know, the high-end lithium batteries. It's yeah. all China. That makes a lot of sense. So, so one of the hard things we did at, at PFF was getting the lithium battery made. And then the real hard thing comes with shipping lithium batteries. Oh, geez. If they're over 300 watt hours, they have to go as hazardous cargo. If they're 298 watt hours, they don't have to go as hazardous cargo. Huh. That's interesting. If you're shipping 100 300 watt hour batteries, it's hazardous cargo. If you're shipping 100 299 watt hour batteries, it's not. So you'd, in theory, be incentivized to put a bunch of battery packs on a robot rather than one big one in order to get around that shipping regulation. Or you derate your battery. Because we designed the thing for six hours of runtime, and then we got into this we can't ship them problem. <laughs> so we derated the battery. You don't charge it up as much. It doesn't carry as much. It's not how much lithium. This is, I think, silly yeah. on the part of the, high, the Department of Transportation. They, they don't want to make the rules. It's not the amount of lithium that's in the battery. It's the watt-hour rating. And there's an ISO standard that defines what the watt hour rating of a battery is. So that was absolutely stunning to us. How do you how do you cheat the ISO standard by just not charging it? Like how does that work exactly? Because the ISO standard says the power rating of a battery is the power rating of the battery with the uh, applicable charging system. Huh. So if you so, design your charging system not to charge it all the way on purpose, then your battery doesn't have as many watt hours. That's interesting. That's really interesting. <laughs> and and we all know if you look at what goes on, right? The cheap hoverboards and stuff that catch fire in New York City all the time seems to be New York. Yeah, those packs are scary. Fire. They are scary. I've got one in a bat safe at home, and I'm thinking I should probably throw it away. <laughs> like, it's it's a terrifying battery pack to have in the shop. There's nothing. We had a hazmat, you know, these big steel cabinets that you put hazardous materials in. We had one in the lab for storing some of the prototype batteries and stuff. Production batteries sat in the warehouse. But the prototypes just anything that can go wrong with a battery does and sooner or later you got a mess yeah, yeah for sure i remember uh when i was a student one of them there was a lithium fire in the planetary robotics high bay at carnegie mellon and 
I don't think anyone got hurt, but it was about thirty-five thousand dollars in just HEPA filters they had to replace, and just a big mess. <laughs> I mean, I think they probably overpaid, but even still, you know, so uh, you know, who wants that? It, in their it's job? when I started. So programmation was a battery-powered vehicle. Excuse me. So that was 1985 we started that. And we used NICATs, nickel cadmium batteries, because they were, ooh, they were the best. <laughs> and NICATs were developed by GE for the space program. Actually? For powering satellites. I did not know that. And when you wanted to dig into good, gory details about them, you talk to folks at GE. And uh, then, you know, other companies, of course, supplanted them as NICADs went everywhere. And you had to deal with this issue of, oh, NICADs have a memory effect. No, they don't. Blah, blah, blah. Wait, where did that myth come from? Because I, I grew up hearing that. And this is It's not the cell that has the memory effect. It's the pack of series cells. So if you have a bunch of NICADs in series, which is typically the case, right? The NICAD batteries weren't perfectly matched. Everyone had slightly different capacity. Yeah, it makes sense. So you get to the point where if you're charging them, discharging them, charging them, discharging them, not fully oh. charged, not fully, one of them runs down to next to nothing. Yeah, it makes sense. And you get it short internally, and it's toast. Yeah. So you call that the memory effect because you lost 1.2 volts out of your huh. 8.9 volts or whatever. Couldn't you fix that with a BMS, or did that technology just not exist? Well, they didn't have BMSs yeah. then. What we did then was you would trickle charge your NICAD stacks. So you'd fast charge them, because that's what you wanted to do. We fast charged ours at a 4C rate on our little vehicles. So four times their capacity rate in amps. And then you trickle charge them to get them all to the same level. And the rate at which you can trickle charge a battery is a function of how the battery can dissipate the extra energy as heat without cooking the electrolyte and damaging the cell. Okay. And heat kills is something you, you want to know in the battery bits. Yeah, that makes Same sense. Same thing is true with lead acid batteries. Each cell has slightly different capacity. And so you do a finish charge on them, they call it, in the lead-acid world, a couple of hours at a low rate. So huh. everybody comes up and the whole pack gets hot. And when you're fast charging a big lead-acid traction battery, like in a forklift, you actually hear the electrolyte boiling, huh. which is just scarier and sin. Um, <laughs> so nickel metal hydrides didn't have that same... They weren't as mismatched as the NICADs were. And then eventually, we would buy our NICADs. Originally, we bought them from GE, then SAFT. And then we'd get them from Sanyo because they had a better manufacturing process. Instead of a screen, they used a sintered metal. So they were more matched. Yeah. And if you knew people who were in the electric RC car world or the electric airplane world, people would match cells. Huh. So you would buy dozens of cells and then run them through charge-discharge cycles, measure each one, and put them together in sets. That's wild. Just based on, like, these ones seem to hover around 1.25 volts or whatever. I think it's 1.2 volts a cell with NICADs, if I remember right. Yeah, could be yeah right. 1.2. Yeah. Yep. And so... Uh, batteries were an issue. And now we get lithium batteries. <laughs> and I remember when I was at, at PFF originally, and the guys were saying, oh, we have to have this BMS, and we have to do this. And I'm like, what? 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 No, I just trickle charge them. You can't trickle charge a lithium battery. They can't dissipate the heat. They uh -huh. cook and bad stuff happens. <laughs> <laughs> So you charge them to a voltage, and you've got a voltage cutoff. And that's what the BMS is doing, is they try to wire it in so it's watching as short a stack as possible, one cell or two cells in series. And it's able to turn each one on and off. 
Mm-hmm. That's int- so. It's able to. I always thought like a BMS siphon charge from the most charged cell to the least charged cell or something along those lines, but it sounds like. I suppose they could, but. Yeah. You know, there, there's yeah, also the issue. Sure. If you have a shorted cell, you have to open that circuit. And the problem isn't just because it's a lithium ion battery. Lithium ion batteries have such high energy density that you could push a pot load of current through this shorted cell. And then it overheats and the whole pack goes whoosh. <laughs> yeah, been there. You, you, you get thermal runaway. Yeah. There was there was the 787 when the 787 had to run a fruit. pack outdoors on more than one occasion because of thermal runaway. <laughs> yeah, and you, and there's nothing you can do except dig a hole and bury it and wait a week. <laughs> I was on a 787. I flew from Boston to Tokyo. On, I think it was you no, know, it was ANA. They were flying a nonstop from Boston to Tokyo. And I said, whoa, I got to take that because I hate this drive flying Asia stuff and stopping in San Francisco or L.A. or something. Yeah. So I got on that 787 flight to Japan. The next week is when they had to ground the 787s because they found out the lithium batteries on board weren't vented to the outside of the airplane and in a steel box. Huh. So they had to ground the 787s because Boeing didn't do their homework on the lithium battery. And, you know, there is this investigation. What is it? It's easy to tell you what it is. There was a shorted cell. And so Boeing's solution ended up being building a quarter-inch steel box to wrap around the battery pack and bending it to the outside of the airplane. That's a, so wait, so the idea is it can still catch fire, but if it does, it's not going to get the plane in trouble. It's just going right. to vent outside. Yeah, they're going to so lose their backup power. You'll lose the power, but, you know, the plane's not going to catch fire. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, normally the plane's flying on its APU. Uh, Auxiliary power unit? Yeah. Okay. Just... And a generator, right? Yeah. The, the jet engines, there's, there, and there may be one in the back and the tail. It's a small jet engine. It's the APU. And so the battery is just there for backup and high-load stuff. And Boeing went to the lithium battery because it was so much lighter. And they also sense. put it on the plane, right? Air makes travel. Sense. You, you want it to be light. But now you yeah. got a quarter inch of steel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It sounds what, pretty heavy. What they taught me, taught me in college in my control areas class. That, yeah, don't put two coats of paint on a Saturn V rocket. It doesn't need it. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. I, um, I mean, this is not a Saturn V by any means, but I remember doing battle bots uh, when I was in grad school for fun, and. Um, there were some teams from MIT there too, from from your stomping ground, and uh, I um, one of my friends warned me not to put a second coat of paint on because he's like, "You'll go overweight on your thirty pound battle bot." Yeah. yeah. Now, when I went to MIT, here's a good one. So I started in '75, and you know I had to clear my major in the freshman year. And I figured I was going to be an electrical engineer because I wanted to get into robots and the AI lab was run by Project Mac and blah, blah, blah. And, but when you looked at the double E curriculum, to graduate from MIT with a double E degree, you have room for maybe two electives over four years. Huh. And I, so I went to the assistant dean of the School of Engineering. And I said, uh, I want to declare as a double E, but I want to leave out this advanced Diffy Q course and leave out this class and that class so I can take a class in machine design and a class in control theory and a class in that and the other thing. And he just shook his head. Nope, not going to happen. <laughs> double E department's too powerful. It's half the engineering uh, undergrads, double E and CS. They're too powerful. They're not going to let you do it. But we have this program in the mechanical engineering department. We can do anything you want. <laughs> Come to us with a plan, and we approve the plan. 
So I picked all the classes I wanted to take, and half of them were in the computer science and double E department, and half of them were in the ME department. And I sit down with the committee that has to approve my plan, and they say, so why do you want to do this? Well, I want to get into robotics. And they say, well, we think that's very noble academically, but we want to warn you, we don't think you're going to find a job. <laughs> Which I say, well, then I'll teach, you know. Nice. <laughs> so I got to take, you know, my ME classes, and I got to take my computer science and double E classes. And then I got to build robots. And I got a job. Yeah, you've had a bunch of good ones. I mean, you mentioned you were at Seagrid, but I mean, you were their chief technology officer <laughs> for people yeah. listening, you know? Like, yeah, uh, I was CTO and COO at most places. Yeah. So, I don't know. It seems like it worked out. Yeah, I think so. I even wrote a book, a textbook. Yeah, I, I got a copy, and I'll be That's honest. Right. I'll bring it with you to the show. I'll sign it for it. Yeah, I'll bring it with me. Thank you. I feel bad. I've only made it through the forward so far because I can't seem to get a moment alone to read. <laughs> but I'm it's, interested. Uh, I flipped through it, and there's like some really interesting bits. Kind of, it seems like at the three quarter mark that I'm excited to get to. There, there, it's it was when we did it. I was when we started U.S. Robots. It was outside Philly. We got a visit from the number two guy in the IE department at Lehigh University. Uh, his name was uh, Mike Groover. And Mike Groover wrote the textbook for CAD CAM for industrial engineers. And he came down to visit us at U.S. Robots and talked to us. And they invited me up to teach some classes. You know, Lehigh's an hour away. So I went up there. And when I was finished lecturing one of his classes, I walked up to him and he walked up to me at the same time. We said, hey, you want to do a book? Because there weren't textbooks on how to design and use and apply robots. And we thought it was important that people knew how to design them. That was my piece. And so that they could apply them properly. So if you didn't know what inverse kinematics were, then you were probably going to screw up programming the robot. Yeah. If you didn't know what the approach position was to a point, you were going to screw up the robot. If you didn't know what parts feeding was, you were going to screw up the robot. So we, and Mike, of course, had written some textbooks that were pretty big sellers. So we put a proposal together and we shopped it to McGraw-Hill and Prentice Hall. And uh, we got a contract from McGraw-Hill to write this book. That's and awesome. I'm taking on, the first chapter I took on was the one on control theory. And I think it took me over a year or two to write that. Because I'm like, oh, crap. This was way easier when there was a professor at the front of the room <laughs> teaching me this stuff. Now, I got uh, to, and then I, I was, when I was doing the bit on kinematics, <laughs> I was using a paper that Bert Horn at the MIT AI lab had written. He's who I work for at MIT um, on the inverse kinematics. And it turned out he had a trigonometric function wrong in that paper. And no one noticed. Huh. But as I'm trying to work it out in the textbook so I can show <laughs> the steps. You must have thought I'm you were going, having an aneurysm. Well, I, I think this minus sign is a plus sign or something. How long do so you I think you figure that out, though? I feel like whenever I find something like that, it's... It's art, like I question my own sanity. Oh, it was it was terrible. I was writing the book on a TRS-80 Model 1 computer. Nice. And a TRS-80 Model 1... Uh, the book came out in 82, old. right? Yeah. I, I bought the TRS-80 Model 1 in 78. Nice. Because when I did my walking machine bachelor's thesis at MIT... I did the uh, control system, not the dynamic simulation on my own TRS-80. That's I wrote, cool. I wrote a program to solve differential equations in BASIC based on uh, an algorithm I read in Fortran. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you read it in Fortran and then ported it to BASIC? Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. 
there was a a large book this I used at Spar because I first wrote that code when I worked at Spar. The guys who did the shell manipulator. Um, there's a book called Numerical Methods in Fortran. And you would open it up and it would have solutions, you know, how to do things. So solve differential equations, there's the Runge-Kata method for solving diffie It's breaking it down, it's turning into a differencing problem. So had it Fortran, translated it to basic, typed it into the trash 80, <laughs> and now I could solve differential equations. It would take a while. Yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so for my thesis piece, I designed this six-legged walking machine, and I wanted to simulate it. So I simulated one leg moving across the screen. So you had to do the two-dimensional representation foreshortened for the three-dimensional movement, and I had to solve the differential equations of motion for each of the three joints of the robot, and blah, blah, blah. And I would literally set it up running on the Trash 80, go make dinner. You call it the Trash 80? Come back, come back, take a picture. <laughs> I had a camera on a tripod with a remote trigger and black and white film, and would take a picture. Wait, and after a monitor? Yeah, I was on a black and white monitor. We nice. got high contrast film, so it looked better. And so after hours of this program running, you know, I could get two or three steps across a screen. <laughs> and I took pictures of it and glued it in and it went into the thesis. Nice. And then when I went to work at Unimation, they had no computers in the company. So this is the world's biggest robot company, not a single computer in the place. How? The, the Unimate robots all ran on TTL. And I was pushing to put a micro in the Unimate method. Interesting. So we had to do a big project for a customer, an automotive customer bearing house, where there would be like 50 robots manufacturing these things. And you have to simulate it just to take into account the mean time to failure of the different robots and size the buffers and stuff. And we didn't have a computer in the company. So I went to my boss and I said, I'll bring in my trash 80 if you rent it from me and pay me <laughs> enough rent money so I can buy more memory for it and it'll run almost faster. <laughs> so I built this simulator for just moving the robots, putting a couple of robots together. And then I started writing memos at Unimation. Boy, it'd be great if we owned a PEP-11. You know, that would be kind of nice. <laughs> then I left. Yeah, it's weird that they had no computers. How much was a PDP-11 in those days? Well, the Puma had an LSI-11 inside. I don't and know the LSI-11 offhand. An LSI-1102, which was the single-chip version of the tiniest PDP-11 you could get. Oh, okay. I didn't know they made that. I thought the PDP-11 yeah. was a rack uh, mainframe. It was. Thing. It was, but the LSI-1102 was the first microprocessor version of an 11. That's pretty cool. I'm assuming and, there were compromises to get it down to that scale. Uh, the Puma only did integer arithmetic. So no floats, floats, no points. doubles, yeah. No. Double and then eventually the they came out with the LSI-1123, which was the same performance as a rack PDP-11. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And when we started U.S. robots, and they were expensive because they were, uh, you know, not like the micros Intel was knocking out. These were ceramic carriers and everything else. So at U.S. robots, we started, we planned on using the Z80, which was Zilog's faster version of the 8080. Because uh, they ran at 4 megahertz. You hear that, people? 4 megahertz. Screaming. But uh, mm -hmm. Peter, who I started the company with, who did the software and the computer side of it, um, we found out that the 6502, which was just an 8-bit micro, it was used in the Apple computer. Even though it was only a 1 megahertz chip, it was the only pipeline processing microprocessor out there. So 
where the Z80. Well, that's interesting. When would this have been, like by by year approximately? This was 79. So they had pipelining in the 79? Yeah, the 6502 was a pipeline process. That's interesting. So even, though it ran, even though it ran at one megahertz, each clock cycle was bringing another instruction forward one step. And so it would bring all four of them in. The Z80, which ran at four megahertz, took four steps to get one instruction, four steps to get another. So, so it was a, a really nothing. Safe performance. Hmm? So it's kind of a net nothing, and they're about the same. Yeah. Right. So we ended up designing the machine around the 6502. There was one on each axis, and there was one for the exec, and there was one in the teach pendant. We had this little board, 6502, on everything. And then to do the math, um, AMD had a product called the 9511, that Intel licensed from AMD. Huh. This is how AMD got the 8080 license, or the 80, 8088 license was a trade for the. That's interesting. And Intel came out with their version of the 9511, which was the 8231 chip, which was twice as fast as the 9511. Huh. And it was a full 32 bit floating point math processor. How did they get it faster like that? Like, did they just... Because Intel were gurus of process. Yeah, that makes sense. They they were a great chip company once. They're still pretty damn good. Um, And so the exact processor, as it was doing the calculations for where the arm had to go, doing the inverse kinematics, would push two 16-bit numbers onto a stack and get the floating point answer back. That's how the 8231 chip worked. But it's doing 32-bit and, and, math, or it's... Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. And and uh, they overheated. They were terrible parts. We had to put two fans in the controller and a baffle just to cool the chip down. Uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting. 6502 was interesting to manage, too. You know, by cross-compiler, so we had a PDP-11 in the company for doing our software development we would cross compile on the pdp 11 push it on to a 6502 uh emulator you know shove the code in run it get the robot on so it, that and we had to build our own amplifiers like i Wait, said where did where did the emulator come in if you're well, you you have a PDP-11 sitting here, yeah, and it's talking to this box. It's got a ribbon cable with a dip connector in it that plugs in where the 6502 would plug into the board. Huh. And you're basically shoving the code down into that thing, and it's emulating the 6502. Chip. That makes sense. Then so that's just to if basically see if works. the code works. Yeah. If it all works, then you burn the code into an EEPROM, the UV prom and you plug it into the board. So it's slash and burn software development. You burn EEPROMs and then erase EEPROMs and burn EEPROMs and erase EEPROMs. All that E-proms. degrades the life of the EEPROM. So you can only do it. So there are a lot of things, things that, the, yeah, that Intel didn't admit about their EEPROMs. We started with 2708s, which were eight kilobytes. We ended up with the 256s when they became available. But the bigger the chip got, the smaller the cell size, the more susceptible they became to strange things. Huh. So we had a robot jumping around. <laughs> and the first time the robot was jumping around is because 8231 chips were overheating and spitting out wrong answers. Makes sense. The next time it was jumping around was because someone took a picture. Wait, what? If you took a flash photograph, the energy went through the window on the UVE prom and got <laughs> onto the data bus. <laughs> so it didn't erase the prom, but it got out onto the bus. So we called the guys from Intel and, you know, give them a sit down and talking to, because back then Intel was only a uh, half a billion dollar company and we were part of Square D by then and we were a $2 billion company. Yeah. So we'd call them, sit them down and say, hey, you know, your UVE proms are susceptible to flash photographs and bright lights. No. Okay, watch. 
quick robot moves. <laughs> Put a piece of tape over the window. Quick robot doesn't move. You guys got a problem. So we ended up making our own custom labels. Because you always put a label on. And in those days, every software guy knew that you had a little label, you know, version 106 and the date, and you stuck it over the window, a paper <laughs> label. We had labels made that were laminated with foil. Nice. So we were sure they were light opaque before we put them in the machine. That's wild that it had to come to that in order to protect the non-volatility of the EEPROM. Yeah, it's... It was, uh, we were the first robot that had battery backed up CMOS memory inside the robot. So you could program it and turn it off and not have to save the program to tape. Nice. Oh, well and good until the battery <laughs> runs down. <laughs> battery lasted longer than anything else. <laughs> yeah. Battery was not the issue. Yeah, it was a good old Nikon battery. Nice. That's awesome. <laughs> so tell me about how you met Kevin Dowling, because I, I, I heard his side of this, and it was pretty hilarious. And I'd be curious to, to get your side of the story. So PRI bought my company in 93. We had talked off and on about selling, and I didn't like the offers they were making. And, and, and by the time 93 came around, I had debt up to my ears, so I had to sell the business. So I sold the business to PRI. And when I went to work there, they had all their engineers. And they all thought I was a snake oil salesman. <laughs> and, you know, as time marched on, I started to take over. <laughs> and there were some of the engineers who were designing robots who didn't like that. So somewhere along the way, and it, so I was VP of strategy and technology. I didn't have engineering didn't directly report to me. So somewhere along the way, they went out and hired this guy, Kevin Dowling, the CMU roboticist. And I'm reading emails one day, and they're from Kevin, and they're like cogent, and he actually understands things. <laughs> I literally walked around the building to find him and said, holy shit, you actually know about robots. This is great. <laughs> that's my, that's how I remembered the story. Yeah. Yeah. His, his version is very similar. I mean, the way he told it, he was hired to look into you and then he found that you had good ideas and you ended up becoming friends. <laughs> so if I can, if I'm smart, what I'll do is I'll try to get him on right after this before the episode airs and get him to tell his side and edit them together. Yeah, there you go. I don't know if we'll be able to get Kevin in that time frame or not yet. <laughs> so. And Kevin, Kevin's an idea minute guy. Yeah, he's and, awesome. Uh, and he knew Hans. I mean, I think that's how I got connected with Seagrid. Um, yeah, he is definitely, he's a smart smart cookie a knowing devil if you will yes knowing devil <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of reverend that fiery red hair yeah but he's turning gray like the rest of us i didn't know his hair was red when i met him it was gray <laughs> that's that's interesting yeah he had fiery red hair mine's probably about 10 percent gray at this point but you know what i have left anyway <laughs> so the chemistry man yeah, no, it's going to be all gray within 10 years. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure it'll get there. I'm just trying to imagine yeah, Kevin know. with red hair. That's awesome. Yeah, and it's just long, you know, kind of the way it is because he was kind of the academic. That's awesome. Apparently my dad's cousin, Lee Weiss, was like his, um, I guess, like PhD advisor. And so he, he, he tells me stories about Kevin too, or he, he used to be croaked recently, but when he was alive, um, I don't know, it, you know, it's a small world, <laughs> put it that way. I've had a couple of CMU guys working for me and with me and one is Seagrid, um, Bruce Thompson and, uh, that is strange, strange man. Just, very straight. 
<laughs> I don't know that guy yet. Uh, tell me about him. Bruce is just a, you know, down to an engineering kind of guy, mostly me- mechanical. He's a mechanical engineer, MIT and CMU. And uh, so I brought him in. He worked for me at, at Seagrid. Um, but when I left Seagrid, he took over doing the standards work that I did at Seagrid. Oh, cool. So, you know, we go down to Florida every year to do the standards, and then he'll leave the standards meeting, get on his bike, and ride halfway down the coast of Florida amongst the alligators, the swamps and stuff. Okay. All right, Bruce, go right ahead. That's awesome. And Bruce worked. He worked for Red Whitaker. And <laughs> he, he was involved in the Chernobyl, in the robotics cleaning out Chernobyl. That'd be stuff. Pioneer, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah. You know, and he still has his dosimeter tags. Oh, that's cool. That. There's some things I wouldn't want to do. That's one of them. Yeah. I know that's a neat souvenir, though. I mean, if you've got, does he, I mean, are they at least like not that, not that dirty? You know, I mean. Right, right. They didn't get dosed too badly. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> when I was working at Spar on the shuttle manipulator stuff, most of my job was designing ground-based manipulators, force-reflecting master-slave manipulators for handling nuclear facilities. So for master-slave, I'm picturing like one of those little mini versions that you move and the big one moves, or is it something different that you're... That's called a replica controller. Replica controller. Master-slave is one-to-one, usually. Interesting. So look at the old pictures of the nuclear hot cells where they were cable driven masters and slaves um can't remember the name of the guy that was at brookhaven and those places where they developed that stuff what's his name um so i was working on a bilateral force reflecting manipulator system that's what i actually got hired to work on at spark they wanted me to do the math for a BFR RMS. And after a lost, like, I'll admit. <laughs> trying to follow. Uh, well, you got a bilateral force reflecting master slave manipulator, remote manipulator system. So you've got the master, and it's driven with motors and had pots. We had pots in them. Okay. And you got the slave driven with motors and pots. So these weren't cabled together. They were electrically wired together. And when you move the master, if you move it too fast, the master is being commanded by the position of the slave. So you're feeling the forces that it feels. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Okay. So so it's bilateral force reflecting. So it's like a force feedback. Um, It's like a replica controller, but it's the full size. Full size. Okay, okay. That's it, and it and it has force feedback. Hence, by well, what you're actually feeling is the delta position is being reflected back as motor torque. That's interesting. So, I built this master slave setup, one axis, where the master was electric and the slave was hydraulic. Huh. Because it was supposed to go in underwater applications submarines I mean, you can do that right? with electric too but i see why you would do it hydraulically back then yeah we were copying ge's diver equivalent manipulator system as well. yeah and to wire it together we had an analog computer and they were all analog huh. power amps That's and cool. you would use the analog computer as the pre-amplifiers and you would wire all the things together just like the drawings you had your control theory class the block diagrams and wherever there's a triangle for an amp or something you had an amp in the <laughs> in the analog computer Actual and we had the pots, we had the pots in each one so we could set all the gains and then we realized why you could never be alone in the lab <laughs> <laughs> okay because i had i had one axis wired backwards and my <laughs> hydraulic manipulator was trying to tear itself off the wall while I was trying to hold the electric one back. Because <laughs> oh, they're both flying out from each other. And I 
had to reach down. I found a spool of instrumentation wire, which is super expensive, you know, twisted pair, uh, Teflon wrap on it and uh, oh, geez. a shield and everything. And I, I was able to, holding the two robots, and reach with my leg and pull the spool over and grab some of this very expensive wire and tie up one arm, tie it to the other one so I can go hit the kill switch. <laughs> So then we made the rule. You can never work in the lab alone. Yeah, it makes sense. Because if one other person had been there, they could have ran over and hit the kill switch. Yeah. Hence, you know, hundreds of dollars in instrumentation wire would have been saved and potentially the life of Mitchell Weiss. <laughs> potentially. <laughs> one too risky. That's pretty hilarious. Ah, you do what you got to do. Yeah. It happens. You know, you're in the robot business sooner or later, you get a runaway. And I crashed a robot through a wall when I was an undergrad. Um, I had this tracked robot that weighed about 150 pounds. And we were, um, I'm trying to remember why why that happened. It was either an overtuned eye term, but I think it was a different reason. I think it, no, it was an overtuned eye term. And then we were teleoperating, but we should have just gone open loop and we went closed loop and tried to stop it and it kept going and went right through a drywall yeah it kept going because the eye term was integrating <laughs> I, hate, I hate integrators gotta have them though it's this whole gravity thing you gotta deal with yeah but this was a flat drive train on the ground like it was just a rookie mistake on my part and if I'd have really been smart, I would have put a better e-stop on it and just been able to kill power, but you know, I wasn't that smart. They didn't teach you about that stuff at Carnegie Mellon. Or, I was no, a grad student, I, but I was I taking think. Carnegie Mellon courses at the time. I'd later went to school at Carnegie Mellon for grad school. <laughs> mm. But yeah, they don't teach students about emergency stops for better or worse. <laughs> so They should. Yeah, just teach them a lot of things. I agree with I'm you. I'm always surprised by stuff people don't know. I once had a software engineer. We were working on this system with 14 storage retrieval systems. We were putting it into a Motorola fab. And, you know, you've got the towers moving and pulling the wafer cassettes in and out and everything else. And he had this loop of wire dangling. He comes to me and says, I got this loop of wire dangling. Can you do something about it? I say, yeah, just grab a wire tie and tie it up. He goes, I'm a software engineer. I don't know what a wire is. <laughs> it was amusing, like, the stuff that the, the computer science guys just programming a robot for the first time didn't know. Like, I, I always feel like they tried to approach it too much like it's a game of Pong. Like, the laws of physics aren't there. and That's right. Yeah. Instantaneous acceleration all the way is the assumption. Or instantaneous deceleration. I mean, I assume when I crash the robot through the wall, you know. It's so, you know, it's just. It's I worked cool. on this lawnmower project between PRI and Seagrid. These guys in Boston started up coming to a GPS guided lawnmower for golf courses. Oh, cool! And so I put the hardware together and did all that stuff, and uh, we're running it. And the idea was you have the software written, so you drive the vehicle along the peripheral of the green, a ponds and islands problem, you do all the outlines. And then these guys who were um, exiles from prime computer in those days would do a, a cutting profile, just like uh, you did for a machine tool. Right? Yeah, that's just what I was thinking. And so we're, we've got the mower coming along to the center of the green and they've got a program to come straight into the center of the green and then take an instantaneous right turn ha. and start to cut the, the corner and so we're meeting and it's mostly russians i'm dealing with all these russian mathematicians and exiles from prime and parametric and stuff and uh oh yeah you know the tractor is no good it doesn't turn fast enough <laughs> Say, what? It's got mats. And then the head Russian 
starts yelling at him in Russian. Where are you from? Mars? Don't you know these things? You got to do a tangent approach. <laughs> so, I mean, when you're doing a 2,000 pound lawnmower with big spinning blades That's on it, it's not going to turn instantaneously. I mean, there's no <laughs> way in hell. <laughs> and really bad stuff can happen when it does. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, we always got the questions. I would, you know, the digital greenhouse in Pittsburgh? Uh, digital greenhouse. I don't think so, to be honest. It, it was part of the Ben Franklin money and you know, it was innovation work stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I was on one of the committees to review the the proposals. And one of the proposals was a CMU professor to do LIDAR for lawnmowers because CMU had a contract with Toro. Uh, and this LIDAR had to be able to see golf balls. Huh. On the ground. With a LIDAR. So I said, no, we don't need to fund that. That's stupid. Why do you say that? Well, I just did this lawnmower thing a couple of years ago, and we talked to the guys who drive the lawnmowers. And we asked them, what happens when you see a golf ball? They say, we mow it. <laughs> it gets cut in half and it gets chucked in the grass casher. What if you see a cat? Mm -hmm. Depends on the cat. <laughs> <laughs> what if you see a bag of golf clubs? We go around it. So there is zero need to look for golf balls stray on a golf course when you're mowing the lawn. Yeah, it makes you sense. <laughs> yeah, you just got to have blades strong enough to... Those blades are, that's the whole thing. It, it was it was interesting working on this thing for like six months and go to their big biannual show that they put on for their dealers. We worked on Toro mowers and Jacobson mowers. That's interesting. When I was a grad student at CMU, and it wasn't that long ago, it was like 2013 to 2015, um, I, there was a case study they did because my program was the Masters in Robotic Systems Development, which was mostly robotics, but then a little bit of business. And um, we did a case study in the business course on some robotic mower where they ended up with, I think it was RFID, like in the middle of the balls or something to try to not mow the balls. I wonder if there's some related politics <laughs> to your story. <laughs> don't mow the balls <laughs> you know, we, we worried about cats and, and golf bags yeah it makes That's sense cats because you're a nice person and the golf bags because they'll destroy your mower and well no the golf bags belong to some of the members of the club <laughs> and the clubs that are going to buy these robotic mowers or put them in are probably private clubs that really want perfect grass because there, there's a whole ecosystem there right if you're GPS tracking all the mowers or position, slam, whatever you want to call it. Um, you can be using the same tech for all the fertilizer you put down. All the, you can change the lay of the, of the grass and how you mow it every day. And all the stuff that they can do that you get advantage of, but it's all about the grass. Every golf course has a guy who's got a master's in turf management. I mean, I insulted the crap out of one guy. I said, what do you do? Go to college for this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Penn State has a big turf management. That's wild. At what point and, do you think a person decides they want to go into turf management? Like, I, I, I shouldn't disparage, but... Yeah, you know, as we learn what these guys do and all the little vagaries about keeping the grass, it's pretty stunning. It's a very detail focused business, the sharpening of the blades and how often and how you do it and the weight of the mower and the size of the tires versus the weight of the mower and the weight of the guy sitting in the mower. Huh. And invariably the guys who drive mowers are kind of big guys. Yeah. So if you start to do things robotically, you can take an extra 300 pounds off the, off the turf. Yeah, that makes sense. But, I mean, couldn't you just have wider tires and have a similar PSI on the they ground? They do. They do. Yeah. But, you know, 
You give the and fattest so, person in the world if you had big enough and enough tires. <laughs> but if you don't have to make the mower so big, like the one I have in my shop now, because a few years ago I was going to resurrect this thing, has five reels on it. Three reels in the front, two reels in the back. Reels being the you blades know, that cut. Yeah. Okay. And and you need them that big because you got a driver. Well, if they were all automated, the mowers could be two feet long, three feet long, and little tiny bugs that run around. Yeah. You don't have to pay a driver. You probably cut on so, fuel cost too. So there's all kinds of opportunities there. But man, yeah, man, you know, just there's enough to do. Don't have to worry about the grass. And and there's like Texas A and M is big in ag and turf. So they're working on water based hydraulic systems. Because what happens when one of the hydraulic motors on one of these motors blows on the lawn? You kill it. Yeah, the lawn for sure. <laughs> you, you destroy the turf. Yeah, that makes sense. And eventually, okay. given enough time, any machine in the world is going to do that. A blow up. So that's interesting. So that way, and, at uh, least when it does, you're just blasting water around. I, right. wonder, I wonder if that presents. Well, I was thinking corrosion issues, but then if you use distilled water, it's probably not a problem. A huge problem. When I was doing that underwater manipulator, there were people trying to work on you know, water as a fluid. And apparently, it's really hard on the servo valves. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense to me. Um, there's a lot of stuff you don't think of when you're you're younger. You know, like corrosion is one of those things where it's just kind of boring and, and non-glamorous and you know, the same version of me that was like, yeah, why would someone go into turf management? Like, why would somebody care about rust? That's so boring. But then, I mean, <laughs> I gave, I gave a talk well, with multiple slides thing, about different types of corrosion. Behind me, this thing behind me lives in the vacuum of space, right? Yeah. What do you do about ball bearings in space? Huh, because... You know what they call putting two pieces of similar metal in a vacuum? They call it welding. How does that work? I, I wasn't aware of this yet. If you put two similar metals together in a vacuum, they will weld to each other. That's interesting. And if you so put dissimilar it, metal, it galvanically corrodes, right? So Well, yeah, you have to get the right dissimilar metals and the right... So all the bearings on the shell manipulator are dissimilar metals or even ceramic balls. And everything we did in the semiconductor industry in the vacuum chamber all the robots you can't use grease because it evaporates and gets on everything and you can't use similar metals that's wild so if, you buy a stock, if you buy a stock off the shelf ball bearing and stick it in a vacuum or in space it'll burn out in no time yep yeah that makes sense i didn't know that that's that's one i would not have thought about that's that's wild the Don't ceramic, know until it happens. Yeah, the ceramic solution makes sense. Ceramic bearings are pretty gorgeous, but yeah, pay for it. Yeah, they're not the cheapest. Plus, they can crack if you look at them the wrong way. But I guess regular ball bearings can too. I mean, they're all you know, hard as all. I mean, you know, given what you're trying to yeah, accomplish. Yeah, they, they typically use different steels. Yeah. And... Um, just different alloys? Yeah. So what are different some, alloys? I mean, this is how much of a nerd I am, but what are some common combinations there in that application? Don't know. Okay, no worries. Have to look it up. Um, you want to be far apart on the pipological scale. That's what it is. At the risk we, of we, like a moron, what is the pipological scale? Tribological scale. Tribological scale. That one I don't know either. Remember when you rub the ebony rod in fur and you get a charge buildup? They're at opposite ends of that scale. That's interesting. So it's like, um, I don't know. I don't want to talk outside my league here, but this is this is an aspect of engineering I've not had to deal with yet. <laughs> so We... Uh, 
at programmation, you know, we want to make everything super clean because we were working on the ceiling of a clean room. So even if we were class 0.5, we were raining down on the wafers. So we actually I worked with some guys at MIT, Alex Locum, Ernie Rabinowitz, who has passed away years ago. And Ernie Rabinowitz is an expert in herbology. So we're looking at things, you know, what materials to use as bearings that wouldn't generate wear. The problem, of course, is I built up charges all over the place. That was a whole other problem. You know, rubber wheels running on anodized aluminum tracks. It's like a freaking Van de Graaff generator. <laughs> so we had to discharge the vehicles. And, and is that just, of just lots of ground wires and, and brushes and stuff? Or how does that work? Brushes. Yeah, but you couldn't make contact. So it had to be really close. Huh. But that was okay, because if you were gap. really close in your war, right, teeny tiny gap, you would occasionally discharge across that. If you make contact, what's the danger? Just friction or? You great particles. Oh, got it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That makes sense. So one thing we had on this system was a turntable, right? So it's a monorail system. Vehicles so come it, on the monorail. Is it even a brush at that point, or do you just have an electrode if you're if you're close but not touching? We used a piece of copper braid. Okay. And we bolted it to the machine, and we cut it, trimmed it to length. And if it was a little long, it would wear and disappear. Makes right? sense. And then stop wearing. So it worked. Um, and it's also true in the forklift business. If you look at any forklift, there's either a ground strap or a piece of chain hanging from the bottom of the forklift. Yeah. Because the urethane wheels build up a charge that sits over the body of the forklift. And when the guy steps off the forklift, he goes, yeah. <laughs> I think Bossa Nova had to do that with their robot too. Cause they, they had a little chain cause of that. We had to do it on the Jita. There's a little metal brush hanging down from the bottom of Jita. So we know this at HDS, there will be discharge paths for everything. <laughs> Smart. Um, or were we, we were talking about the little wheels, herbology. Oh, yeah. So I had this turntable. It was a direct drive turntable. So this is like 1990 design. So a big DC hollow core mo motor about the kits from inland see so about the rotor about the magnets and a single big um gothic arch bearing four point contact bearing so that way the body of the thing was pretty small so it was sitting near the ceiling cars would drive on it it would rotate they'd switch their path and go about their business and the thing had a big hole in the center so the laminar air could flow through it as well as it could so every time we built something like this or designed something like this we had i had a clean room and a particle counter laser particle measuring system which you know you had to pay twenty thousand dollars to buy one and you would cycle the machinery and you'd put the particle counter up there and count the number of particles <clears throat> and when stuff is really clean you believe the particle counter is broken so the trick is to take a dollar bill and tap it. And the dollar bills shed so much shit. You'll see the numbers. <laughs> That's oh, interesting. No. Probably so, a dollar bill like better than a hundred, I'm guessing, because it's ratty or. And I didn't have hundred dollar bills. So yeah. I don't know. Never, never did well, that. I mean, I would think the higher the denomination, the less it's been handled, the less degraded yeah, it is. Yeah. The lower the denomination, the better it is for that experiment. Yeah, probably. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we're testing things. We're getting these particles. Now we have to know what the particles are so you can figure out the source. So you put a little piece of filter paper on the vacuum for the particle counter, and you send it off to a testing lab that has a scanning electron microscope. And they can do the mass spec and tell you what's in there. So they're looking, you can't even see the dirt on this thing, but they can pick it up on the microscope. 
So I get back that it's got bronze in it. It's copper and brass and da da da. Well, okay. We were worried about the carbon brushes on the motor, but it wasn't the carbon brushes on the motor. It was the retaining ring in the bearing, the ball separator. Ha. Huh. Not have bearing often has a little brass ring. It's a separator for the balls. That's what was shedding. That's interesting. So we had to go to a ball bearing that had Teflon slugs as the ball separator <laughs> to solve the problem. And no grease. It worked. Nice. But it, it it's neat because when you're working in the clean room and you're getting particles, what you're seeing is where. So I love thinking of it as uh, dirt is the first derivative of where. I see schmutz. I know bad things are going to happen. <laughs> Integrated over time, things wear out. Yeah. So the machinery we built for the clean room had no wearing parts. You know, the we Teflon had didn't even wear? Hmm? The Teflon doesn't wear on the ball carriers? Or if you don't overload it. Interesting. So you have to, like, yeah, maybe it does. But if you're seeing less than one particle a day, who cares? That's fair. Yeah. So, like, well, we I mean, use steel ropes, steel ropes to run counterweights up and down on our elevator systems. We would design the pulleys, custom design the pulleys, so that the rope nested perfectly in the <laughs> root of the pulley, and we hard anodized the pulleys so there'd be no wearing between the the vinyl cover of the uh, of the rope and the pulley. That's cool. So these are things that I use and designs I do now, whether it's for that or not, because I'm not trying to make them clean. I'm trying to make sure they don't wear out. Yeah, yeah. last longer. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. That's really interesting. I like that. Like, dirt is the first derivative of wear. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll be thinking about that as I go about my job. <laughs> It's a great way to, you know, you just put a piece of witness paper under something that you're running back and forth, and if you see a bunch of particles on it, you know you got a problem. Yeah. That's interesting. And, I mean, I've certainly seen some interesting wear patterns, and but that's stuff I could see with the naked eye. I mean, that's not even looking at paper yeah, or, paper. you know, scan electron microscope, yeah, got, you know, no less. Well, that's because I had to figure out what the source was. Yeah, it makes sense. So all those seals we put on bearings and all that grease we use and everything to make it work better sometimes makes it work worse. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I was trying to do something for a high-temperature application a while ago, and I remember trying to do it on the cheap and buying regular bearings, but then using solvents to pull the grease off and putting special high temperature grease on. So, uh, I don't know. It was labor intensive. <laughs> it, uh, PFF. I was lucky. I had a pretty good staff there and we were testing you know, we're getting these motors with gearboxes from China, and we really don't know what how much grease is in the gearbox. And what's the failure mode of the gearbox? And a lot of the planetary gearboxes, the planet gears are just on bronze bushings on steel pins. So if they're not greased well, they're going to seize up and fail. That makes sense. So the poor engineer who was tracking this down you know, he's got like 10 of these motors on this rig he put together. It's running 24-7 with weights on it and everything else. And we're monitoring the friction changes in the motor, the current changes in the motor to do the same work. I'm figuring, okay, that's an indicator of the bearings going or the gearbox is going. And then we're, okay, which grease do we want them to use? And then you start going around and around. What's the best grease for the job? 
Hmm. And how much? What's their process control for putting it in? That's another thing I, I learned along the way working with some Japanese companies. Just process control. If you do it right and you do it the same way every time, you get the same result every time. Interesting. That's not something I've done as much in, in my work, but it seems worth doing. Yeah, the whole Toyota method uh, for product development and release really works. Uh, the Europeans have codified it in an ISO standard um, that I had to deal with for the motorcycle radar stuff. Jeez, the <laughs> European standards. Oh, my God, the pain. <laughs> When I sell stuff in Europe. You got an all European nah, standard. They're see. actually very good at prescribing how to do things. Where the, they hurt is they end up over prescribing the design sometimes. But the safety standards, the how to do risk assessments, the standards they have for self driving cars and all this ADAS equipment, yeah, they're they're not bad. Cool. Uh, especially if you don't have to meet them. If you're reading the standard to give you a blueprint of what you should worry about. Nice. Yeah, that's that's always handy when you have that resource available. Of course, for the Italian motorcycles, I did have to meet them. <laughs> and sense. we had to meet FCC regs. You know, you put radar in something, you got to get it FCC tested. Any challenges there? Yeah, the labs that can do it, there's two in the country. It'll be radar testing. Wait, two in the States or in Italy? In the States. Got it. So we did our FCC cert here, and we had them do the European standard at the same time. It was like 30 grand. It sounds about that was free. For this gizmo, this is a little blind spot radar system. Nice. It's a pretty looking radar. It's a very nice package. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Cast on the back. Is that a Deutsch Injection. connector? Hmm? It says is that a Deutsch connector on the back? No, that's a, uh, a Molex connector on the back. Oh, nice. Looks looks. And similar. there's a little a little air vent in there for expansion. Oh, cool. And then the, the plastic has to be just right, the right thickness, so it doesn't affect the radar underneath. Is that due to altitude, thermal, or both for the expansion port? No, no, it's the thickness of the material affecting the radar signals, the RF absorption of the material. Yeah. So this face is only about a half a millimeter thick. No, I get that. I was talking about the port on the back you showed for expansion. Oh, Oh, that's you're in a car or a motorcycle. Temperatures are going all the way up and Got down, it. so you have to be able to vent it. Otherwise, you'll blow the seals because it's also sense. watertight. Yep, yep. So makes a lot of sense. The thing has to be IP67. Has to be able to run from zero degrees Fahrenheit, like minus twenty C to one hundred and forty C, or no, one hundred forty F, whatever it is. Yeah, almost one hundred C. Um, no corrosion, so it's all stainless screws, aluminum, and plastic. And if the pressure inside gets too high, the little O-ring seal is going to blow. So there's an O-ring seal on this thing. That's cool. <laughs> In order for it to be IP67. You ever ride a motorcycle in the rain? Not yet. <laughs> Neither have I, but the Italians tell me. <laughs> we actually sent you to, they have a great test lab at Piaggio. In, uh, can't remember the name of the town. Anyways. So we sent Jita there to be tested. Oh, cool. And they can make it rain. How much rain do you want? How do you measure this? Oh, it's inches per hour of rainfall. Well, that's pretty freaking scary. Because <laughs> they could really dump a lot of rain. And they had all the shaker tables. You know, you look at a motorcycle frame, they had equipment set up to behave like a big fat guy sitting on the bike and getting off the bike, except <laughs> doing it 10,000 times to that's make sure amazing. the frame's 
know, it's stuff you got to do if you're going to be a yeah, real car sense. builder. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I would imagine. Yeah, it was kind of fun working with the guys, but yeah, that sounds enjoyable. Yeah. So, and one one of my guys is heading out there now. One of the guys who used to work for me is heading out there now to work on a high performance bike. So he's got to go to the test track and, and test everything on this high performance bike. Nice. We even worked with their racing team to see if we could using our measuring capabilities with stereo cameras and radar and stuff to measure the position of the racer on the bike. If you look at MotoGP, which is the Formula One of motorcycles, you're talking the difference between winning and losing is typically under 10 seconds. And it's all about, a lot of it is about when the guy shifts his butt in the seat on the huh. That's pretty wild. Okay. So if you can understand the pose of the rider, you can train better to win those. Events. Well, you can try to train what the racing team engineers told us was you can't tell the riders anything, but they want to collect the data anyways and, and learn and try to work with them. And then one of the engineers, his fantasy was putting a big weight in the bike and having motors driving around. <laughs> Yeah, if you can beat a person with a robot, I mean, that's the dream, right? <laughs> right? You have the person on there, but he's just sitting still. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying to counteract the dude, you have a weight. Doing to, the wrong thing. Yeah. Yeah, 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 so the dude can be as sloppy as he wants. Or as I mean, sloppy it, as she if wants. you think about it, you're riding a bike. I mean, I learned all these things from them. I didn't know any of this stuff. You don't steer a motorcycle. You lean a motorcycle. Yeah. And the lean gives you the curve. So if you know the lean and the speed, you know the curvature. And, of course, if you know the curvature and the lean and the speed, you know the centripetal forces, and you know when you're going to lose friction, when the guy's going to slide and die. Yeah, right? makes sense. It's not correct. So if you start your lean too soon into the curve, You've wasted, you've scrubbed energy off the tires. If you put your arms out too much before you lean, you're creating wind resistance. So it's all about the driver's position. Huh. It's a, on the straightaway, it's about the engine. <laughs> you know. But in the turns, it's about pose. It's about the driver position, it's about pose. And it's all kinds of little details, suppose, because aerodynamics and motion dynamics both come into it. Yeah, it makes sense. And then the road. If the road's bumpy, see ya. Yeah. When, okay. they would, when they would race in Austin at uh, One America, America One, whatever the track is. It's a terrible track, apparently. Almost no one finished, you know, qualifying without... Well, no one made it through qualifying without having an accident. Jesus. It was a couple of years ago. Yeah. It sounds uh, bloody, to say the least. I, I was looking into uh, doing a motorcycle trip in Thailand about a year and a half ago, and... Um, I still want to do it. I didn't get to because the COVID travel restrictions were a bit of a moving target. And it seemed like every time I sort of got my head around what I was supposed to do, you know, I either read the wrong country's regulation or something changed. <laughs> I ended up just going to France instead. But anyway, um, one of my friends uh, who used to work for me and is getting a PhD and is probably going to work for me again taught me how to ride uh, in like parking lots. He brought his uh, his motorcycle. He, he was finishing up at NASA, going to University of Michigan, and he stopped through Pittsburgh and taught me how to ride a motorcycle. And, you know, we did the whole, you know, parking lot thing. It was really fun. And then he did this drill with me where, you know, he's like, all right, and I'll drop. It was kind of a beater bike. Like, you know, he 
replace parts and he's like okay now drop it and pick it up and see how fast you can get back on it because people in thailand are get annoyed at you because you're gonna fall because you're a rookie and so see how fast you can grab that thing well and if it's then, a big bike you can't even pick it up this was a little one and i think the ones over there are kind of little like it oh, yeah. maybe 50 cc's like it wasn't it wasn't huge and then what i remember that was kind of um terrifying but also you know i mean kind of a reality check is the more i went down this road and i started telling my friends what i was doing anyone that had ridden a motorcycle and invariably would tell me about a near-death experience they'd had on their motorcycle like that's why they call 100 percent. that's why they call them donor cycles <laughs> hadn't heard that yet but it's on the nose oh yeah that's why the white home when when uh, I started working for Piaggio Fast Forward two days before they had a board meeting. Every quarter we had a board meeting and the muckety mucks from Italy would come. And uh, so we're out to dinner and the head of Piaggio USA is there, which is basically a sales operation. And, you know, the muckety mucks, the chairman of the company and CEO is there. And I'm going, yeah, I, I'm thinking I want to get one of those MP3s, which is their three-wheel bikes, two wheels in the front and one in the back. It's, it's a glorified scooter, but it will do 90 miles an hour. So nice. Take them on the floor. And I say, yeah, I was thinking I want to get an MP3. Oh, yeah, we can set you up. And I say, but my wife won't let me. Don't worry, we'll get her one, too. <laughs> No, that's not going to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up that radar unit. It goes on the back of an MP3. And we ended up having one at the office. And it cured me of wanting to own one. Why is that? Because <laughs> you look like such a dork sitting on these giant motor scooters. <laughs> It's an oversized scooter. They use them in Israel for the uh, ambulance service. It's just faster, or like, why do they do that? Yeah, they can get through traffic and they can get people. The EMTs get out there. They don't carry the patients on them. Yeah, it makes but the sense. EMTs get there first, so they use the MP3s. How do they evacuate for that? the patient if they get there, but they don't have transport back? Well, they they bring out an ambulance, oh, gotcha. but this way the EMTs get out there much quicker. And they can start assessing the scene and treating yeah. the patient and stuff like that. Yeah, stabilize. You don't transport till you stabilize anyway. That makes sense. That's clever, actually. Yeah, you get there first. Yeah, and they're nice bikes. They're very stable. You can actually lock them upright. When you turn the bike off, the tilting mechanism locks up. That's cool. So they're pretty cool bikes. Yeah, right, yeah. I think the top of the line MP3 is about ten grand. It's a lot of money for a motor. Well, for yeah, a vehicle, I mean, for, I've paid you yeah. know, way more than that for a car. I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> they have an electric Vespa now. There's actually a Vespa museum at their factory. That's pretty funny. And there's a Moto Guzzi museum they're redoing too. Kind of fun to look at. That's awesome. Yeah, not to mention that robot is really cool. I mean, I'm trying to think how do they, how do they market that as a motorcycle company? Like, how do they? Mobility. It's all about micro mobility. That's why they set up PFF in the states was to what's the next big thing? And they decided the next big thing is walking. Yeah. Getting around town. It's like 50 percent of the trips in an Uber are under two miles. Something ridiculous. Can you stash so that thing in the trunk of an Uber and like take it you with could. you? We came up with the Cheetah Mini. You can stash in the trunk of a car. That's cool. Uh, the full size Cheetah is a little heavy. It's fifty pounds. It's hard to pick up, carry around. Ah. Um, <laughs> but you know, I mean, uh, a full size Cheetah will easily carry a case of twenty four. Yeah, that's that's all so, you need. <laughs> You should try to bring yeah, it to the New I, Orleans I, market. The, the, it's, I don't think it's selling all that well. Uh, I think it's kind of a tough hill to climb to convince Americans that they want to walk more. 
And if we give them this following robot, they can go to the grocery store and do this, that, and the other thing. Um, but, you know, maybe sooner or later it'll take off. As soon as people figure it out. I had one here at home. I used it in the garden. Nice. Well, every time yeah, I show anyone, you know, the retro robot we made, uh, you know, at the early stage, they always say, I wish I had one of those for home. And it's the same thing. I mean, it's it's a robot that carries your crap. And so I, I can yeah. imagine, you know, every single person that said that. I mean, the Jita is way less expensive. You know, it doesn't have tank tracks or any of that crap. Like, it makes more sense. It's it's a better product, not to shoot myself in the foot here, but... <laughs> it's pretty nice. We did stuff in construction sites. We had a following spot on construction sites. What's the so spot that we have on construction site? Yeah, a big application for spot is inspecting construction sites, measuring the performance of the construction along the way. This is a big I'm construction sure site. Love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> So they, they walk it around to it, and it's got light, LiDAR and GPS on it. And they can go around and capture the pictures of the work that's being done. So we showed Cheetah following it because that can carry all the tools. So the idea was a guy could have all those tools and not have to schlep them around the construction site. Cool. Yeah, it makes sense to me. Yeah. And we even mounted the technology onto a spot. The spot would follow you. Because you don't want to be driving spot while you're on a construction site because you're going to fall down a manhole. Yeah, it makes sense. You want to be walking um, and aware of your surroundings. But, you know, we'll see. It'll take a while. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, there's a big difference between uh, interest and purchase orders, as one of my own friends said to me. So. Yeah, I'm trying to get people to part with 3K for something they can't go into a store and play with. Yeah. So the original idea was we were going to sell them using events around the country. So we had a sprinter van and a trailer and big screen TVs and pop up tents and everything else. And then this COVID thing popped up after the first event was held. <laughs> Two and a half years, we couldn't take Gita anywhere. That's brutal. Yeah. yeah. COVID screwed over a lot of business deals. <laughs> yeah, it was what it was. Glad I'm not in the restaurant business. Oh, amen to that. Yeah, that was the worst one to be in. Although I heard that like takeouts businesses got an uptick. Like I, I had a friend who owned a burger franchise in Seattle. And he was saying that they had really, really good business during COVID because of the takeout business. So I thought that was that was kind of an interesting. Yeah, I think it kept going. a lot of restaurants alive, which is nice. But it also oh, sorry, I gave to... us GoPuff and DoorDash and Uber Eats and all those terrible things. <laughs> yeah, I'm of the opinion that if you're going to go to a restaurant, you know, this, not to get political, but like. Oh, here's a funny Uber story. So I go to Pittsburgh for the Seagrade Company Christmas party. Take the wife, spend a few days in downtown Pittsburgh, and we went to the Hofbrau House in Pittsburgh. <laughs> That's, That's, where the company, <laughs> That's where the company Christmas party was. Nice. So we decide to leave when people start standing on the table singing and dancing. <laughs> My wife and I decide, yeah, it's time for the old people to get out of here. <laughs> So we get an Uber. I play Ring of Fire on the and the Oompa Band. <laughs> like they do over there. <laughs> so we get in this Uber. And I don't ride around in Ubers a lot. I don't live in the city. I live in the suburbs. And so I'm trying to be nice to the Uber driver. I say, you've been Ubering for a long. Nope. First day. Oh, what did you do before this? I was a forklift driver. Now, Seagrid, of course, made unmanned forklifts, right? Still does it, so, I know. At that point, I decided I shouldn't go any further with this conversation. <laughs> Some poor forklift driver is now driving an Uber. <laughs> I um, took an Uber to a job interview at Uber Advanced Technologies Group one time, and that was a keep-your-mouth-shut situation if I've ever been in one. 
<laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> yeah, give me a ride to the place where we're trying to get rid of you guys, so give me a ride. Yep. It was interesting, though, because, like, one of the big employee perks there was, like, unlimited Uber credits. Like, that was, they said that on their job descriptions. You will get showered in Uber credits. <laughs> Thinking that's got to be awkward as hell, <laughs> and, it, and it was. <laughs> They're gone now, right? Yeah, yeah, they've been gone for a few years now. Um, yeah, I think Aurora got their location and most of their folks, or a good amount of their folks. I don't know if it was most or not. I remember once being interviewed by a magazine about the whole self-driving car thing. And I said, yeah, no. <laughs> uh, it, it was, you know, the the NHTSA regs are terrible. They're NHTSA regs? Na- National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, whatever it is, NHTSA. The, the regs around self-driving cars are brutally bad. You know, it's the Wild West. Yeah. And... Uh, Obama tried to put in new ones and then Trump immediately scrapped them and Bob Biden hasn't done anything with it to make it better. Sounds pretty accurate. <laughs> yeah. My conception of those guys. And we even had debates with Seagrid. There were guys at Seagrid who said, no, oh, no, there should be less regs so we can do more innovating. And I'm like, you're going to kill people. There are good regs we have in the forklift business. There's good machinery safety regs. There can be good regs on these vehicles. But there aren't. <laughs> it's, we're so political in this country. It's yeah. silly. I mean, I guess another example of that was like when the pandemic was in full swing in Q1 of 2020. I really thought it was going to unify people. And, you know, we've all got this common enemy and it's biological. It's not person and... You know, surely politics don't matter in this. And nope, no, it became political. No, the enemy is, you want me to wear a mask? (laughs) You're taking away my rights. (laughs) And as, as, as a man well into his 60s, that will be 67 this week. Congratulations. I do wear a mask when I go into a store. Especially Costco. <laughs> yeah, I would. And I saw I one guy. Had a, I have not had a flu since the pandemic. I have not got COVID yet. Nor has my wife got COVID yet. That's so awesome. My kids both got COVID. I've had it. Times. I think I've had it like three times now. But I'm also not masking up as much. Uh, that's probably the difference. I was using isopropyl a lot when I was handing stuff off to coworkers. So if we'd meet up for a handoff, I'd blitz whatever I was handing off with isopro and then hand it over. And I think I was also yeah. wearing gloves. <laughs> I guess I thought it was going to kill me. Sure. So I talked to the uh, guys at the ISO group about their factory, Punta Dera. That's the name of the city. I was suggesting they glove up, and they got very angry at me. Now we'll use wash stuff. Okay. Well, when I, I worked in the clean room stuff in the semiconductor industry, you're wearing a bunny suit, wearing a mask, and you're in a building with HEPA filters running all day long. Man, you never cared about the pollen outside or, or anything else. You were clean as a whistle. It's a great place to be during pollen season. That's pretty awesome. Of course, you're wearing plastic gloves all the time, so your hands are blistered and (laughs) shaped and miserable. Humidity, yeah. Yeah, and your lips chat because it's so dry. There are downsides to working in a wafer fab, like all the deadly chemicals, arsine, phosgene. Well, you've got to wear a see-through backpack too, right? Because it's got to be polymer in order to not have fibers go everywhere. No backpacks. That's inter- I, I had a buddy at uh, Global Foundries who had a see-through backpack that he was taking oh, yeah. to work. I think it was because it was uh, – he said it was because it was a plastic backpack, and so he wasn't as worried yeah. about fibers. Yeah, no fibers. Yeah. 
The bunny suits are made out of these polyester monofilaments, so they don't shed much. That's interesting. Uh, but the the chemistry in those things, you know, I had an architect tell me one day I was working on one project at Motorola. You say, yeah, if you want to kill yourself, just go stick your head in a gas cabinet. Just go stick your head right in. They have, you have the clean room. Yeah. And then in the floor below that, you have a lot of the plumbing and the gas services. And they use a lot of gases that are very inhospitable to human beings. Huh. So you have these gas canisters that are hooked up to all the process control equipment that plums them. And those gas canisters are inside gas cabinets. Intera. I didn't know about this yet. So they can be monitored. Yeah. The joke is you want to commit suicide, you open a gas cabinet and stick your head inside. Oh, because there's probably like little leaks and all that stuff. And there's yeah, yeah. crazy. Yeah, they're not pleasant chemicals. Yeah. You like arsenic? We got arsenic. <laughs> like phosphorus? We got it. Benzene uh, right over here, probably. Yeah. <gasps> when I started working in that, um, they were doing wet chemistry for all the wafer etching. So you're doing hydrofluoric, sulfuric, and phosphoric acid. Huh. Hydrofluoric is a calcium seeking acid. Right? Hydrofluoric is the one that eats glass. Right? If you're going to etch wafers, you got to etch glass. So it's a calcium seeking acid. If you spill phosphoric on your skin, you won't feel it until it gets down into your bones and starts eating them away. And then you'll feel it all of a sudden. And then you, it won't be a good thing. So, you know, they would teach us as part of the safety going in these fabs what to not do, what to do. And when you're etching the wafers, we we're using robots to move the wafers in and out of the acid baths. Yeah. You have to make sure you don't move from um, hydrofluoric to water. One way or the other, you know, you can't add acid to water. You can't add water to acid. One or the other goes boom. There's a, there was a mnemonic someone gave me about that at work, and I'm trying to remember. It was something out of acid before water. I, it's, yeah. I, I, I lost it, but it's it's annoying. I, I should know because the mnemonic. I, I, was, I had a small process lab for something, but anyway, I'd go on. Yeah, no. So, you know, we're programming the robots to dip wafers in phosphoric and hydrofluoric and sulfuric and yuck. I think you're supposed to add, ah, I'm going to get it wrong. But yeah, that's that's wild. <laughs> I had a friend who, uh, is the same guy I mentioned from Global Foundries. He burned one of his hands all the way down to his bone with, um, I think he was... I want to say it was a pyrophoric. Um, I want to say it was potassium. Like he had like a little chunk of potassium, like get on his hand and just you know burrow in there. Yeah. There, there was a sign. A, a sign on the door of the fab at Moto. I think it says sodium kills. So you have sodium on your skin and your hands. And it'll tunnel through the wafers and ruin them. Ah! <laughs> Sodium kills. And we used to talk about the million dollar sneeze. Someone's walking along with a cassette of wafers and sneezes. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> it was really easy to sell automation into an environment like that where the, the biggest problem was people. You can't wear makeup, you can't wear contact lenses. Um, contact lenses because if the acid splashes, they can't flush your eye out. Wild. Makeup because it gets all over everything. Yeah, it makes mm. sense. Yeah. They're heavily it's automated just, too. I mean, I oh mean, yeah, yeah. They like probably the most heavily automated industry as far as I know. Yeah, I read the National Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors. I haven't read it for years, but I used to be on the committees that wrote it. And a big part of it is designing the automation. Yeah, that's that's awesome. 
So I've been in automotive plants, but I've never actually been inside a semiconductor plant. I'm guessing you've been in both. Like, what are some of the differences in terms of uh, the level of automation you see? Uh, well, semiconductor plants are, everything's handled by machine now, right? A uh, single wafer will never be touched by a person. Uh, cassette wafers is hardly ever touched by a person anymore. I've got overhead monorails loading each of the process tools. Um, inside the process tool, it's fully automated. In the auto industry, but you're not bringing parts, right? You're not doing assembly in a wafer fab. You're doing multiple layers of etching and coating and plating. In an automotive factory, first thing you notice is it's filthy. Plain and simple. Um, That's true. It's ad, hoc, it's ad hoc because they designed this factory in 1950 and they're still building the cars in it. So they moved the chains, they moved this, they moved that. <laughs> Um, yeah, I've seen that. Wafer too. fabs, wafer fabs. You go to the next generation wafer. You tear the building down. You build a whole new one. You drop ten billion bucks. So it's it's really not fair. Um, so wafer manufacturing is the most complex process because there are so many steps in making a wafer, hundreds of steps, and a lot of the steps are re-entering. You come back to the same tool multiple times. So from a scheduling and planning perspective, it's a real pain in the ass. Um, and it takes a lot of rocket science. Automotive factory is very linear. Stuff comes in at one end, goes out, finished at the other. Um, and then, you know, there's always the funny things you see in an auto plant, like the car going down the line without its doors because the door didn't come to that station in time. <laughs> They'll save that for the last station when they fix things. Um, but at C grade, we were moving a lot of material around in car factories, bringing the parts to line. We did it at Whirlpool, at white goods, washing machines or like cars. Um, but there's still an awful lot done by people because of the odd shapes and everything else. You know, you have to reach in and get a ring. Makes sense. We did, we did a factory in Europe for JLR, Jaguar Land Rover, that used to be a Ford factory. So in the 50s, Ford built this factory. And umpteen years later, it got sold to Jaguar Land Rover. And they still had the overhead chain conveyor moving the car bodies around. And you still had the giant presses doing the stamping. Uh, the project we were on, they had bought a new servo-controlled uh, sequential press. So it was stamping out all the parts on a Land Rover, all out of aluminum. And we were moving all the parts through the line. So... You know, in the automotive industry, it's kind of tricky because you have so many parts in a car and they come from so many places and they've outsourced so much of it. Um, and the factories are legacy factories for the most part. You don't get to build a whole new one. Like Spring Hill, Tennessee, GM's plant they built for Saturn. Remember Saturn, a different kind of car company? <laughs> well, now they make Cadillacs in there because Saturn doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> so they don't throw the lines out. You know, when they talk about retooling an auto plant, you always hear how much the auto industry spends on retooling. Still got the same conveyors running through the line. You know, they're reprogramming the robots a little bit. Retooling is really about the the stamping tools. Yeah, they make the body panels out of. Yeah, and that's just replacing the tooling there. But yeah, that makes sense. That's interesting. You said ten billion dollars to spin up a fab. Yeah, that's that's a different scale. It's a whole different story. When when it hit a billion, I gave a talk at an economics conference on September. 2001. So this conference was three days in upstate New York. <laughs> That's wild. Put on by the New York state government and 
SUNY. And, How many people attended? You know, oh, there are people from all over the world at this thing. And then on September 11th, you know, hell starts to break loose. Yeah, yeah, I get that. That's why I was kind of wondering if attendance dipped off. And half the people left. But they had nowhere to go. They couldn't get anywhere. No planes flying. My talk was on the 12th. I was preparing it. I was in my hotel room on the 11th, finishing up my slide deck and putting it on a floppy disk to hand to the, you know, a coordinator. And my wife's phoning me and saying, you should turn on the news. And I'm like, I'm busy. Damn it. Leave me alone. <laughs> and we turn on the news and all hell's breaking loose. And half the people at this conference were from Wall Street. And they're watching the TVs. And meanwhile, the conference is going on because there are people from all over the world and there's no place they can go anyways. Yeah. So I gave a talk on the 12th about how the semiconductor industry can't continue at the rate it's going and how much it spends on capital equipment. Yeah, apparently it can't. <laughs> But the Albany Times Union picked up my story. Nice. I've never been so, in the Albany Times Union. <laughs> so then I got in my 95 Mustang convertible and drove home on the 12th. And it was absolutely stunning along. You come down the North Way, New York State Thruway, and then across the Massachusetts Turnpike to Boston. So you know, a few hours of driving. And you stop at the rest areas along the turnpike. And on the 12th, every tractor trailer was pulled over to the side of the road. Because nobody knew what was next. So they had to pull over. So you're driving along the turnpike and all the tractor trailers are pulled over. Why you the get to the trailers? rest Because they might be carrying bombs. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they stopped them all. Makes sense. And you go to the rest stops, and there are all these families heading somewhere on vacation or doing something, and they're all just like shell shocked. Nobody really knew what to do. At least I knew I was going home. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was it was surreal. My kids were in a panic. They were in high school. Dad's in New York. Oh my God, Dad's in New York. Dad's upstate. Don't worry. About it. That's fine. <laughs> Totally different place. Yeah. Yeah. But um, State Senator Bruno was supposed to talk. Pataki, I think, was the governor. So he backed out, obviously. It makes sense. Because he had more important stuff to do. I think Bruno, Bruno was the opening speaker. I didn't see him. It was the day before. It was the 10th. But Pataki copped out. And then we had some speaker at dinner on the 11th, you know, talking about nano something or other. And I'm like, bullshit, I'm going home, turn on the TV. <laughs> so I'm going to my room. I want to see what the president's saying. I don't want to see this guy. <laughs> I ate my dinner and went and watched the news. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it was an interesting time. I think I, I mean, this is embarrassing how young I was. I think I was in middle school and I got pulled out of school. It might've been high school. I, I was either like late in middle school or early in high school. And I got pulled out and I just had no idea how to react. I, I was just confused. And It's confusing. It was, uh, like I said, it was really surreal. Yeah. Just And then for days afterwards, we really didn't know what to do. Yeah. I became a U.S. citizen in May of 2001. Oh, interesting. So I had lived here for 25 years as a non-resident, as a resident alien, and decided finally in 2001 I'd take the test, get my citizenship papers. And boy, was I lucky, because if I had waited come September, <laughs> now the rules all changed. It got a lot harder. <laughs> What kind of stuff, stuff did they ask you for the citizenship test? I've, I've heard oh, it's kind of silly. It's, it's hilarious. 
there, there's a set of like 50 questions that they give you beforehand so you can study them. It's basically a civics test. How many members of Congress are there? I don't even know the answer to that. Uh, <laughs> what are the, why do I? Not anymore. I remembered it for the test. And then, oh, then they have to give you the test of English as a written language. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, being the good Canadian I am, <laughs> who does kind of speak English with my lawyer. <laughs> if you don't have a lawyer, it's really a pain in the ass. And the person says, I'm sorry, I have to ask you this. Will you please step up to the whiteboard? Yeah. <laughs> I, I have um, two children. All right, is there anything else? You know, is that it? She says, yep, that's it. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just silly. So challenging. <laughs> when you're dealing with Canadians, it's silly. But the rules are so bogus because, you know, when I was in college and I was trying to get job interviews and I couldn't because of security risks from those kid agents. <laughs> and, and, and I'm complaining at the foreign student's office. Are you trying to tell me that if I was a professional hockey player, I could move here? No problem. But because I'm an MIT graduate, you don't want me. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's wild a lot of the the stuff with like who you can hire and who you can't hire with um you know the permanent resident versus you know what is it u.s person it's annoying as hell i mean when you're trying to get good engineers and you've got somebody awesome from india or wherever and they're not technically a u.s citizen or they don't have their you know their green card they're not even legal a resident, right? Yeah, if you have to get people on an H one something, yeah, you know, I went through it. I I worked at Unimation in practical training, and we started U.S. Robots up, and I was still here on my practical training visa. My lawyer saying, "Don't answer the phone; it might be immigration calling." <laughs> and uh, then we had to post the job. First, you have to get. I don't, know. I don't know. You have to prove somehow that you're not taking anyone's job. So this is 1980, and we're writing the job for chief engineer at U.S. Robots. Has to know robotics and AI and this, that, and the other thing. And we're posting it in the Norristown Times Herald, <laughs> which is basically a steel town. Yeah. And any applicants? Yeah, you have to get your labor certification. No, we got no applicants. You know, so we put all the paperwork together and go to the government with, here's my labor, you know, here, here's the job thing. So I got my labor cert. So then I could get my H1 visa. And I lived on the H1 for a couple of years until I got my green card. And then like, you know, a year after I got the green card, I got married, which would have made it so much simpler. <laughs> but I did it on my merits. <laughs> but now getting an H1, you know, so the good. lottery... The number is so puny of how many they give out. It's tough. And they really, you can get, if you are um, a famous actor or actress, a doctor of global repute or some silly statement like that, huh. global renown, um, skilled in the arts and sciences, is a preference category that has this limit on it, this quota on it. That's annoying. So actors, oh, professional athletes, actors, professional athletes, doctors. no problem. Yeah. Doctors, yeah, high-end doctors. Uh, doctors no of problem. global repute. <laughs> yeah. But CMU grads, Caltech grads, MIT grads, Stanford, not you're Berkeley. in the same pile. You're in the same pile as everyone else. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I I was kind of dating someone in Chicago, like for a really short amount of time, and she was from Uruguay, and she got deported because her like her lottery ran out. It was it was highly frustrating. Imagine how she felt. <laughs> Yeah, I'll bet you wasn't too happy about it. Yeah. 
Well, I remember. She was, uh, she was like a Sears mergers and acquisitions person, too. Like, she wasn't just some schmuck, you know? And so. When I was working at Unimation my first year after school, the practical training visa was good for six months. And usually, you leave it up to your company to do that stuff. So we were shut down for Christmas vacation, and I had no papers. So I couldn't go home. So it's really kind of tough for Canadians because home is so close to the U.S. Yeah. But if you don't have your papers, you can't go home because you won't be able to get back in. It makes sense. It's stupid, but it makes sense. It is what it is. Yep. And it isn't what it isn't. Is there anything you want to plug uh, while we're while we're kind of on the way out? Uh, there's not much we're ready to plug at HDS yet. We're building a really different order fulfillment system. Cool. Not like Eva. Not like anybody. It's a highly integrated. I'm calling it no sort order fulfillment. And all the way grounded. Hmm? You did say it was grounded, so I just kind of jokingly went, and it's all the way grounded. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, if you look at how order fulfillment works, and you look at a lot of the companies that are out there right now, you do your storage and retrieval of goods, like the big Kiva shelves that move around, and an operator picks those. But if it's a big order... They have to get consolidated with other items that aren't even picked by that person. So they go into a tote and they go down a conveyor and they go to a sortation station and then they get consolidated and then they get packed. So we're coming up with a way to do it directly from storage to packing with none in between sort. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and it's, it, it turned out to be pretty cool. We didn't plan on doing all that. We're just plan on making a really nice fulfillment system for ourselves but yeah, you know we stumbled across some clever ideas and, off we went. and you know why we stumbled across clever ideas because we kept asking what's the problem what are we trying to accomplish and how fast do we have to do it and what's the complexity of it right if you know this as an engineer if the problem is clear the answer will present itself. Yeah. You know, every one of the 30 odd patents I have is because I was solving a problem that was clear as a bell. So that's, that's more about asking why than how it almost sounds like. Always. That's right. What is it you're trying to accomplish? And, and people talk in solution space all the time. Oh, we need more cameras to do this. What are you trying to accomplish? What's this? We don't want to hit people. Why do you insist on using more cameras? Maybe you should use more lasers. Maybe you should do something else. What is the requirement first? Let the design fall out of that. Makes a lot of sense to me. Yep. All right. Those are great. Sometimes words. you have to... Sorry, after you. Hmm? I was going to say those are great words to end on. But... <laughs> yeah. No, it is. Uh... Yeah. Tell me, tell me what, not how. What not how. All right. Thank you, Mitchell. I appreciate it. Pleasure having you on. Thank you, Spencer. And uh, we should definitely do this again. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krause is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.